Okay, we'll uh, we'll get started here. And um, sorry about the beeps. Um, okay, so we are going to uh, talk about numeric optimization. We um, we started this topic on Friday, and we talked about derivative based optimization. And derivative based optimization was fairly simple in uh, in concept. All we uh, um, all we have to do is, you know, find the derivative, or you know, use the derivative approximation function, and then we find the uh, the roots of the uh, derivative or approximate derivative, and the uh, the roots of the derivative or approximate derivative should reveal to us um, critical points, which should co correspond to local mins or local maxes. Okay, um, I want to, uh, you know, like uh, many other derivative based things sometimes um, sometimes they fail and so um, today we'll uh, we'll take a look at golden section search golden section search is a more uh, robust um, minimization or optimization algorithm and uh, and it's similar to the bisection method in that um, it kind of uses some just numeric ideas uh, to kind of create a smaller and smaller window so in bisection method, you know, we were finding roots by kind of just splitting the uh, the interval in half, and uh, and we've picked whichever um, whichever side of the interval um, went from negative to positive or positive to negative. In golden section search, we do something similar, except uh, we you know we start off with an interval, and uh, and we reduce it okay uh, in, in size, and uh, and it's called golden section search because it relies on using the, uh, the golden ratio. The golden ratio allows us to um, kind of reuse values and save ourselves some computational time. And so, um, so the golden ratio, you know, it often shows up when, when we're talking about, um, you know, seashells and things that grow in nature and, uh, and the Fibonacci sequence. And in that, uh, you know, when, when something grows, often it, it follows, um, uh, the, the golden ratio or, or something along those lines. And the ratio is basically the ratio between one and one plus X. And, uh, you know, the ratio from X to one is the same as the ratio from one to one plus X, okay? And so this uh, rectangle has been drawn according to the golden ratio. And this smaller rectangle over here, so this over here is a square. And the smaller rectangle over here has the same uh, aspect ratio as the larger rectangle. And so if I kind of transpose this over here, these, the blue, the orange, and the red arrows all have the same relative sizes, okay? And so, you know, the, the ratio from blue to red, okay, that is uh, from one to one plus X is the same ratio as from blue to red over here, that is x to one, okay? And so uh, x to one has the same ratio as one to one plus x, or, you know, x to one has the same, you know, blue to red has the same ratio as blue to red, uh, which, you know, and yellow to blue has, or yeah, yellow to blue has the same ratio as blue to red, which is uh, one of the properties here, okay? So this is kind of the diagram to illustrate how we would go about solving for the golden ratio. And, uh, and so at this point, it's just a matter of kind of setting up your proportions and doing a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of algebra here, okay? So we've got one over one plus X, or the, the ratio between one and one plus X is the same as the ratio from X to one, okay? That is what I have here, blue over red, one over one plus X is the same ratio as X over one, blue to red, okay? And, uh, and now we can just go ahead and solve. So I've got one over one plus X and X over one is just X. And then, so I multiply both sides by one plus X and then I, you know, distribute and, you know, move things around. So I've got X squared plus X minus one is equal to zero. And then we're just gonna use the quadratic formula to figure out the roots, right? So I got negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus four AC over two A. All right, and so this becomes negative one plus the square root of five over two, okay? Um, you know, in the diagram, x is a distance, so it's going to be positive. Technically, we could have negative one minus the square root of five, and that would lead to negative one point six one eight. But uh, but here we'll just use the uh, the positive side, 
And so we have X is something around 0 0.618. It's, a, it's an irrational number, but 0.618 is kind of close enough to what the, uh, the golden ratio is, all right? Okay, I think most of you are at least kind of familiar and I, to the idea of the golden ratio, right? Like some, somewhere, somewhere along the way, you guys have encountered this thing. All right. So, um, so there's a few neat things is that, you know, if you do one divided by 1.618, you get something around 0.618, okay? And then also, you know, if you just rearrange some terms, uh, one minus 0.618 would give you 0.382, but that's also gonna be 0.618 squared. So when you take 0.618 squared, you get the same thing as one minus 0.618 or, you know, the, the golden ratio squared is the same as one minus the golden ratio. So there's so there's some neat kind of uh, when you use this, you get some neat coincidences uh, working out for us, all right? And the golden um, golden section search takes advantage of these kind of uh, I don't know about coincidences, but these properties of the uh, of the golden ratio. Okay, so let's say we have this function, right? Let's say we here's just a very simple function x squared minus 0.8x, okay? The minimum happens at 0.4, okay? And what we're gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna illustrate how golden section search uh, applies and, and works for this, okay? Some of you guys already watched the video in the homework, so I think in the homework instructions, I, I linked a video and some of you guys already watched this. So this is gonna be all review and whatnot, um, but, uh, but I've got some slides to kind of explain along here, okay? So, um, so this is the uh, function we want to minimize, you know, and uh, and so here just arbitrarily we just kind of set up some kind of interval and we say, you know, we're going to look for the minimum on this interval. All right. And so just for simplicity, I'm going to set up, I'm going to use the interval going from zero to one. Okay. And that that makes it real easy. The width of my interval is one and that's going to just kind of keep things simple. But of course, you know, you can start off with any arbitrarily sized interval and it's going to search for uh, the minimum in that thing. Okay, so we just have this and and we're just going to make it an assumption that the minimum value or at least a local minimum value is exists somewhere between the endpoints of our interval. All right, and so um, I'm going to label this this bound over here L the lower bound and this bound over here is going to be called U for the upper bound. Okay, so we're going to go from L to U. And we're going to identify kind of two internal points between L and U, all right? So, so wherever you have an interval, we got an interval going from L to U, all right? So this distance in red is U minus L. And, uh, and we're gonna have two interior locations, an X1 and an X2. X1 is located um, the golden ratio phi from the way from L to U, all right? So this, you know, this is proportionally 0.618 of the way from L to U, okay? And then X2 is located the golden ratio from U to L. So this is 0.618 from the way, on the way from U back down to L, okay? So this is, this is gonna be around 0.382. This is gonna be around 0.618, right? So all we're doing is we're just taking the lower bound plus phi being, phi being the golden ratio of 0.618 times you know, this distance, in our case, u minus l is one. And then x2 is gonna be u, which is one minus phi times that distance. So we get something around 0.382, okay? So if I, if I plot, um, you know, draw lines at that, okay? This is uh, 0.618 away, and this is around 0.382. And we evaluate, we evaluate the function at those two locations, right? And so, you know, I, I've plotted the curve, but in reality, we don't even need to, we, we don't need to plot the curve at all. You just figure out these kind of these two interior locations and you say, which, which value is higher, all right? And so here the blue value is higher than the yellow value. The value at X1 is greater than the value at X2, okay? And so just knowing, so even you can imagine this curve is invisible, just knowing that the blue value is greater than the yellow value means we know that the minimum is not going to be on this side of the interval. Okay. And the reason for that, okay, is because we said, you know, between um, 
between the boundaries, this, this side and this side, we know that there's got to be some, some minimum value, okay? And, and if we take this blue dot here, we know that it's not going to be on, that we shouldn't look over here because we know that there's at least one value on this side, and that's this yellow value. We know that there's at least one value on this side that's less than the blue value, okay? So if we're going to be searching for a minimum value, we should search on this side. So we're going to just, we're going to eliminate this, okay? We're going to reduce our search interval by this gray amount, by around 38%, okay? We, we reduce our search interval by around 38% because we know, again, we have two interior dots and we're going to say, you know, if there's a minimum, the minimum's got to be on, um, it's not on this side because we know there's at least one value over on this side, okay? As far as this blue dot goes, we know there's at least one value on the left, um, left hand side is um, to, to that that's less, okay? And so we know at least this yellow dot is less. Now that we're not, we don't know if this yellow dot is the minimum or not. It doesn't matter, okay? We just we just know that it's on that it's on this side of the blue dot, okay? Yeah, here. Uh, Yes, we are searching for the minimum, okay? Uh, we're searching for the local minimum, okay? We're searching for a local minimum uh, in this interval. All right, is that okay? The kind of the reasoning for eliminating the, uh, this, okay? Well, so, uh, to, so there's a question. It says, how do you know that there's no other value lower than the yellow dot in the shaded area, okay? So like we could have a function where it like dips down even further, you know, like like it suddenly takes a, a bend and it dips down here. Okay, so um, the uh, golden section search guarantees that we'll find a local min. Okay, if there's multiple minimums inside this interval, it golden section search does not guarantee that it's going to find the global minimum inside the. Um, um, inside the uh, the interval, okay, it, it it does guarantee that it will find at least a local minimum, okay, and so because we know there is at least one dot lower than the blue dot over here, we know that there has to be at least a local minimum on this side uh, of the blue dot, okay. You're right. There could be you could be there could be uh, some kind of uh, <laughs> you know some crazy dip down here. And there could be another uh, local minimum on the on the right hand side of the, the blue dot. Okay, but um, but we're just assuming that there's going to be at least one local minimum, um, and uh, and we know that at least a local minimum has to be on the left side of the blue. Okay, this is slower than bisection. Bisection is useful for finding roots. Um, you can't use bisection for finding um, a, a minimum though. Okay, bisection uh, will, will fail at uh, finding um, a minimum. Okay, comparing its speed for the binary search uh, for a minimum. Uh, I'm not. I don't know how how it compares. Okay. All right. So um, uh, okay. So this is um, where it's going to go. So so golden section search is considered one of the slower algorithms, but it's very robust. Okay. It's going to. Uh, it, it will it will find a local minimum. All right, so, so we've eliminated this side, okay? And so we know there's got to be a local minimum somewhere on this side, okay? And we're going to then readjust our interval, okay? This lower bound will still remain the lower bound, but we're going to change this x1 is going to become my new upper bound, okay? x1 is going to become the new upper bound, All right? So the old x1 becomes the new upper bound. And here's the, uh, the genius of golden section search, okay? This x2 is 0 0.618 of the way over to the right-hand side, okay? Because of, so if you remember, this, um, the, uh, the old x2, all right, if you look at it, it's 0 0.382, and if you calculate, all right, here's our new um, upper bound, okay? The new upper bound, is, uh, is 0 0.618, okay? And if we say, all right, well, where is the new X1 gonna be, all right? It's gotta be phi of the way across from the lower bound to the upper bound. And if you search for that, that's gonna be located at the old X2 value, right? 
so so the um the um so the this this um what we used to have as the x2 is going to be the new uh, x1 value here okay and so we don't actually have to recalculate right so the, this value that we calculated here this location x2 and this function value this yellow dot we don't have to recalculate that we can reuse it okay we don't have to recalculate and and that's helpful it just in case let's say you have this function that's very complicated and it takes you know each value you calculate takes a long time to uh, to compute all right um, in that case you you save yourself computational power by not needing to recalculate this you can just reuse this right so so we can just reuse this value um, and we just call this our new x1 okay and so what we do now is we're going to have to figure out the new x2 value right so the new x2 value is going to be 0.618 of the way from u down to l right so this is our new l this is our new lower bound this is our new upper bound okay we're reusing this value and then we calculate the new x2 value and we calculate the uh, the function at the new x2 value right and so this is you know in this case it's going to be around 0.236 etc cetera, etc cetera. is that okay what's happening here so so here uh so now we've just kind of reduced our window a little bit by around 38 percent we've got um this value inside here and this value inside here okay and then we do the same kind of thing we say all right let's compare the uh, value of the yellow dot versus the value of the blue dot okay whichever side is higher we know that okay so we know between um, these two there has to be at least a local minimum on this side of the yellow of the yellow dot okay because the yellow dot is higher than the blue dot we know there has to be at least a local minimum that's lower than the blue dot and so i mean lo lower than the yellow dot and so we're gonna we're gonna eliminate this side we're gonna eliminate uh l to x2 we're gonna say all right we know that um we're we don't have to search here we can search in between this this spot and this spot so x2 is going to become our new lower bound and uh, and we will continue on and then x1 again we can reuse this uh calculation in the next next thing all right so x2 becomes the new lower bound the old x1 becomes the new x2 all right and then we have to recap we're going to have to calculate a new x1 location and uh and, and the function at that spot all right so we continue on and we calculate this right here okay and so uh so these two are pretty close but it looks like the blue dot is a little bit higher and so we're gonna next thing is we would eliminate everything to the right of x1 here okay and so that becomes the uh, the next thing and then I've gone ahead and I've calculated kind of the, the two middle lines here. Um, if you compare these, the left side is a little bit higher than the right side. So we're going to eliminate that. And this is our new interval. And if you uh, if you calculate these two, I think the left hand side is still just a tiny bit higher than the right hand side. And so we eliminate that. We compare these two and now the right hand side is a little bit higher. So we eliminate that. And so if you compare these things, you're going to notice that we eliminate this and this dotted line remains in the same location okay it just switches from being the dotted line on the right to the dotted line on the left okay we've got two dotted lines here we're going to eliminate the left hand side this dotted line on the right is going to become now the dotted line on the left okay the dotted line remains exactly right there and now we have these two dotted lines that we're going to eliminate everything to the right the dotted line right here which is on the left is going to become the dotted line on the right Okay, and so on and so forth. So this is this is how the uh, golden section search goes. It just keeps eliminating basically around thirty eight percent with each iteration. Okay, and eventually the uh, the window will get small enough that you can just say, all right, this is close enough, and this is going to be our um, our local minimum. Does that kind of make sense for a uh, golden section search? What's happening here? All right, and it's numeric. Uh, it's a numeric method no derivatives are involved it just requires evaluation of the function at a few points and at each iteration it only has to evaluate one one new value for it to uh, to continue on okay you don't have to recalculate a whole bunch of things so as far as the termination condition you know there's lots of uh, conditions that we could use 
one common choice is that, you know, when the difference between the upper bound and the lower bound is less than some arbitrary value that you've cho chosen, you're going to just stop there. Okay. So you're going to just say, all right, when the, uh, when the interval is, you know, a certain width, we'll just, we'll just call it quits there. Okay. Um, I guess uh, or a few other things, right? So if the minimum lies in the interval, it will find the minimum. If the minimum lies on the interval boundary, it will converge to the boundary point. Um, so, you know, if you, if you didn't, if the minimum is, yeah, is that the boundary? Okay. And if multiple minimum exist in the, uh, in the interval, the algorithm will converge to at least one of the local minima. It's not guaranteed to find the global, one, global min, but it'll converge to at least one of them. All right, and so here's uh, here's just some uh, some code that I've written up, uh, adapted from uh, from another uh, uh, thing of code uh, from Eric Kai, and um, this is uh, I think I've included this in your homework, so uh, so you can perform um, coordinate descent. Okay. And uh, all right, and so this is you know basically it calculates x one as lower plus phi times upper minus lower, x2 is upper minus phi times upper minus lower, it evaluates f at x1 and f at x2. Oh, here I put in the number of iterations just for the next couple of slides. This is not actually necessary, okay? And then again, if f2 is greater than f1, we're gonna set x2 to be the kind of um, the new up lower bound. And on the other hand, um, we, we would set x1 to be the new upper bound. So here um, we're going to try to uh, just see how this thing performs, um, and uh, and the, so the true minimum is at zero point four, and so if I give uh, the function f to the uh, golden section search, and I say search on this interval zero to one, and I use a tolerance of ten to the minus five, it converges in around twenty four iterations. If you want um, ten to the minus six, it takes around twenty nine iterations, and this is um the value that it converges to at 10 to the minus 7 it takes around 34 iterations and uh you know it doesn't get exactly there but r rounds off at around eight decimal places and at 10 to the minus 8 it takes around 39 iterations okay all right and so it seems like oh does it really take five extra iterations each time to uh to converge and the answer is yeah it's gonna if you want an extra if you want your interval to be about one tenth the size um, of another interval, uh, it's going to take around five extra iterations. Okay, and that's because you know um, every additional iteration is going to shrink by around a factor of sixty-two percent ish. Okay, it's going to go. You know, the next iteration's intervals are going to be about around 0.618, the size of the previous iteration. Okay, and so if you do two additional iterations, this you know uh, after two additional iterations. You know, its interval is going to be around 38% the size of the original interval. All right. And so if you take phi and you raise it to the fifth power, then it'll be around 9%. And that's that's going to be where you get kind of around one tenth the size of the uh, of the additional um, of the you know earlier earlier interval. So if you want to shrink your interval by a factor of around 10, it's going to require around five additional iterations here. Okay. Is that good? All right. Oh, I hope I have time to do a coordinate descent. Let me go ahead and give you um, the quiz answers for today. And I, again, I've, I'll have to go back and fix Friday's answers here. All right. So I just double checked. How embarrassing if I get these wrong again. Um, the first one is C, C as in cat. C as in cat is the first uh, view quiz answer. C as in cat is the first view quiz answer. All right, okay, so coordinate descent. Um, oh, what happened? I'm missing slides, okay. Um, okay, well, so there's something called a grid search and I've got to, um, uh, all right, so here we go. Okay, so a grid search is kind of a brute force method for, um, for finding a, uh, a minimum of a univariate function, okay? So univariate optimization is actually pretty easy. Even if you don't know any algorithms, it's not too hard to do it, right? We can, we can do um, 
guess just kind of this brute force grid search. And basically that's when you graph a function in R, you're basically doing kind of a grid search, but without the search, okay? Um, so, you know, in R, a lot of times when you graph, you have to kind of create a sequence of X values, and then you evaluate the function at all of those X values, and then you graph them all, and then you just kind of look at the graph. Um, here for a grid search, I just take a whole bunch of X values. In this case, I have around 6,000 X values, okay? From minus three to three. And I've you know, separated them by around 0 0.001 each. I evaluate F at, uh, at every single X value. And I say, all right, which, which value is the smallest here? Okay, it's gonna say the 3,400 first value is the smallest. And I say, all right, um, what's the value there at X? And X at the you know, 3,400 first value of X is 0 0.4. And that's gonna be kind of the, the corresponding uh, minimum, right? Um, if we wanted to do a multivariate function, however, all right, what happens is the number of locations that you have to evaluate in a grid search grows exponentially. All right, so every time you you add another variable, it's going to grow exponentially. So, so in one for one variable, we had around six thousand locations to to search. Right, we we search at negative three, then we're going to search at negative two point nine nine nine, and then two point nine nine eight, two point nine nine seven all the way up to 2.99 and three positive three, okay? So we have around 6,000 locations to search. If I have two variables, X and Y, then I've got 6,000 X locations to search for every 6,000 Y locations to search. So, so I'm gonna have around 36 million locations to evaluate, okay? 6,000 squared is around 36 million. I'm gonna have 36 million, all right? If I have um, another, another variable, if I have X, Y, and Z, I've got a function in three variables, then that's gonna jump up to around 216 billion, okay? And then, you know, you keep adding uh, an additional uh, dimension and it just, it continues growing uh, exponentially. And so, um, so sometimes you have functions of like 18 variables, functions of, you know, 37 variables and, uh, and a grid search is simply just not gonna work in those cases, all right? So what coordinate descent does is it takes this multivariate function and it basically just does univariate minimization, one variable at a time, right? So if you got like a function of two variables, what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, you know what, let's, let's hold one of the variables constant. And if you hold the one of the variables constant and you only allow one of the variables to actually vary, then it reduces down to a univariate function, right? So you, you kind of think of like partial derivatives. You know, when you find partial derivatives, you basically assume everything else is a constant and, it, and then you just kind of take derivatives as if it was like a univariate function, okay? Similarly, we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna hold all of the other variables constant and then we, um, we're gonna just minimize the, uh, the function um, in, in one variable at a time, okay? And so to, uh, to illustrate this, um, I have this kind of, I don't know, this fun little script. I don't know, as fun as, fun as a script can be. Okay, so um, let me, let me increase this. All right, and let's, uh, let's make my plot neater, okay? So there's a, there's a library called Plotly, and, uh, and it's pretty cool. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to load up the uh, golden section search function here. So this is a uh, golden section search. This one uh, doesn't pr print out how many uh, things that we have. All right, and here's my function in two variables, okay? And, uh, and just so you can see what it looks like. Let's go to uh, Wolfram Alpha. Uh, this isn't, this actually isn't that nice. Okay. Well, it kind of looks like this, but uh, here. Um, I'm gonna create some uh, stuff for the, uh, the plot. I've posted this code online uh, and you can take a look and play around with it. Um, 
it's it's kind of fun okay and um are you guys familiar with the outer function in uh in r basically uh so i have a a sequence X and a sequence Y, and then outer basically creates a matrix uh, of basically every combination of X and Y, and and basically G is a bivariate function, and it's going to kind of um, compute kind of uh, so this first value is negative one point five and negative one point five. It's the top left corner will be um, G when X is negative one point five and Y is negative one point five. And then the next will be when um, X is negative 1.5 and Y is negative 1.4 and so on and so forth, okay? So anyway, uh, I calculate this out. Z is gonna be a big 71 by 71 matrix um, where X is evaluated, at, or G is evaluated at all of these things. Okay. And then here, um, I create a surface plot with Plotly, okay? Now I'm very new to Plotly, so there's probably a whole bunch of really cool stuff you can do with Plotly. Um, but, uh, but this is just a basic thing, okay? And so um, Plotly creates a, a thing P and I say print P and it creates this. And you can see when I hover over it, it, it does all sorts of stuff. And then I can also like rotate the, um, the, uh, the plot, right? So I've got this three dimensional surface plot. And so this is, um, this is a, what do you call it? <laughs> A 3D paraboloid, right? It's the surface. It's a paraboloid, and uh, and so you know when you look at it from top down, uh, it's it's got these. I don't know what the right word is. Concentric. Would it be concentric ellipses? Can you use the word concentric when you're talking about ellipses? But basically, like, um, so the the global minimum is somewhere down here, and then you've got all of these um, ellipses. Yeah, these, these these would kind of form contours. And, uh, and you can kind of see, you know, where X and Y is at some value and, and you can kind of see this. And what we want to do is we want to find the, uh, the, the minimum of this thing using um, coordinate descent, okay? So I'm going to just start, all right? And so I've intentionally, so I've, I've posted this code on uh, CCLE for you guys to look at. I've intentionally written bad code that, um, does this like manually one step at a time? Okay, uh, it's I mean the code is fine, but it's not um not an elegant approach. Okay, so so in the coordinate descent algorithm, you don't want to have to like recalculate your univariate function every single time. But I, but I intentionally did it just just so that uh, when you do your homework, you're not going to just copy and paste my um my answers here. All right. Okay, so basically all I'm going to do is I'm just going to add my starting location. Okay, so this is my starting location. This little yellow dot here or ball or whatever shows up on the surface. You guys see that? Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to perform coordinate descent. All right, and so the way coordinate descent is going to work is um, so this yellow dot is at y equal to uh, 1.5 and x equal to negative one, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna hold y constant, okay? So here, um, my function, I'm setting y equal to 1.5, and then the function is just gonna be, um, uh, the, the function g at iteration one is just gonna be the, the evaluation of this, where I, I plug in y equal to 1.5, wherever I see y here, and, um, and so now this is just a function of x, okay? So the original function, we have a function of x and y. Um, you know, it's uh, x squared minus 2x minus 0.5 xy plus 2.5 y squared. And here I'm just replacing, every time I see y, I'm replacing it with 1.5. So this becomes x squared minus 2x minus 0.5x times, you know, some constants and add some constants, okay? So this is just now a, a function of x, okay? And again, this is, this is not the best way to go about it, but I've I've just done it to kind of show you, like here I'm plugging in y equal to 1.5. This is actually even unnecessary. I don't even need to put this in here, right? Because I plugged in y equal to 1.5. All right. And then um, what we're going to do is we're going to hold y constant at 1.5, and I'm going to add a trace here. Okay. 
And so this yellow line represents what the, what the function is when you hold y constant, okay? The, uh, the multidimensional surface just becomes a univariate function of x when y is held constant. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna search for the minimum of this yellow line, okay? And so the minimum is gonna be probably be somewhere around here, okay? We're gonna just, we're gonna search for the minimum of this yellow line, okay? And, um, and so I use golden section search, okay? I'm gonna plug in this function here. I'm gonna say, give me the minimum, the X that minimizes this yellow function and says, oh, it's minimized when X is 1.375. So right around, uh, I don't know, some, somewhere around here, that's where it's minimized, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna add a marker to the, uh, the plot, all right? And so this white dot represents the minimum where, where this yellow line, this univariate function is minimized. It's minimized at this white dot, okay? Is that all right with everybody? Okay, and then so now what we're gonna do is we have to, now, uh, now that I've got the X that minimizes this, we're gonna hold X constant, and this is gonna become a function of Y. So we hold X constant, um, X we're gonna hold at 1.375. I take the, uh, the entire function and I plug in 1.375 at every location of X. Got 1.37 squared, that's 375 squared, two times 1.375 times X times, you know, so now we have a Y and we have a Y squared. So this is a function of Y, okay? So we have a question. It says, does the lower bound for the X1 have to do with Y equal to 1.5 or is that just coincidence? Yeah, uh, yeah, here the uh, bounds of the, uh, the plot are just, I've, I've chosen them to kind of just arbitrarily um, show, because <laughs> I know the minimum is located somewhere in here, right? I just kind of, I, I intentionally chose these, okay? But, but you don't have to do it that way, right? So now I'm going to um, plot the univariate function where I hold X constant at 1.375, okay? So I'm gonna add that trace. And so, so now we have um, we have a univariate function here, and uh, and it's a little bit hard to uh, to see it because uh, it's white. And um, but basically, we want to find the minimum of this of this white line now. Okay, so we're going to take this and we're going to find the minimum of that. Right. So again, I use golden section search to minimize it. All right. And so when y is equal to one point three seven five the value of y that minimizes this is gonna be 0 0.1375, okay, 0 0.1375, all right? So y is minimized there. And, uh, and then I'm gonna go ahead and add a marker there. Okay, and so I put a yellow dot there. So this yellow dot is located at the minimum of the white univariate function there. And then, uh, and then I just kind of, I keep repeating the process, okay? Now that I have a new location for Y that minimized this white function, okay? We're gonna hold that constant and we're gonna plot a trace, okay? So that's this yellow line here. And, uh, and we can see we're getting closer and closer to the kind of the global minimum, but we're gonna take this yellow function here and we're gonna try to find the minimum of this univariate function. So we're just taking this two dimensional thing, we're holding one variable constant at a time and we're turning the two dimensional function down to a univariate function. And, and if you have a higher dimensional function like five dimensions, okay, you would hold four of the variables constant and it just becomes a univariate function. And then you, you would have to kind of cycle through each of the variables one at a time, holding all of the other variables constant and, uh, and minimizing uh, with respect to one variable at a time, okay? And so uh, I do this for the, uh, the next one and, okay, the, uh, the value that minimizes this yellow function is right here. And, uh, and we just kind of continue on and on and on, okay? And, uh, and so, you know, at the next iteration, I didn't bother going this, um, is that you would have to uh, do this, right? So, uh, so if you're getting this no package called Plotly, you've got to install Plotly, all right? You just do install.packages.plotly, okay? 
Oh yeah, you you have to install it first. Um, so the starting Y, this this dot up here, this was just completely arbitrary. I just chose this um, just because it fit inside the uh, the window that I selected. Okay, and so what you're going to get is kind of this. Uh, a lot of times you get like this staircase pattern, or you know at least a bunch of right angles um, going through uh, through the plot there. So I don't know. I thought this was kind of neat, right? It's kind of neat to uh, to see this. I don't know if you knew that R was able to do stuff like this in your um, plot window. So um, so anyway, uh, check out Plotly. Um, it, it exists uh, for several languages. It exists for R, obviously. And um, you know, I I only know how to scratch. I, I barely scratched the surface. I know you you can see a whole lot of really cool stuff uh, in Plotly. Um, just a word of warning, if you have an older computer, um, Plotly might make your computer cry. So, um, so just, a, just a warning there, okay? Um, any questions on coordinate descent? I don't, I don't know how old your computer, right? Just try it out. If your computer works, great. And if, if it cries, then, then, you know, that's too bad, so. Um, Questions on, um, I don't know, does that make sense as far as coordinate descent? We're just, we've got a multi dimensional thing, but we reduce it to univariate. And then once you have a univariate problem, searching for the minimum is, uh, is fairly quick. Okay. Uh, here I've been using golden section search uh, just because it's robust. But if, if you didn't want to do golden section search, you could you can minimize it in any way uh, that you want. And uh, I mean, you could even do it manually, right? You can just, um, you could take a univariate, like you can do a calculus yourself and uh, find the derivative, set it equal to zero and solve to find uh, find where it is, okay? Um, so for your homework, you are not going to use Plotly. Uh, you have just a bunch of contour lines that I think I've added in ggplot. And then you will just kind of, what you will draw is the, um, the straight lines, okay? Or at least line segments. You draw a line segment starting from this orange dot going to this white dot, a line segment going from the white dot to the yellow dot, another line segment going from the yellow dot to the orange dot, and then a line segment going from the orange dot to kind of the next dot, so on and so forth. And it's going to kind of, it's going to be like uh, a bunch of little staircase jagged lines, okay, is what, what you will see. Um, I would say for each step, not just iterations. Um, so I want to see a staircase um, thing for each kind of uh, for each step in the, uh, in the plot. Okay, um, let me give you the last two answers. The last two quiz answer, view quiz answers for today are D and A in that order. D as in dog, A as in apple. Okay, so this is uh, this is coordinate descent, and uh, and I've shared this uh, this script on uh, on CCLE. Uh, you can play around with it. You can put in other things, and uh, obviously, you'll probably want to improve the uh, the way I've done this. This is this was intentionally like the way I wrote. You know, I write a new function g for iteration one, g for iteration one b, g for iteration two, and g for iteration you know, you know, whatever that <laughs> that's not the best way to go about it. Okay. But, um, but it works. All right. Uh, we'll call it, uh, call it a day there. Um, have a good night and, uh, and we will see you guys on Wednesday. Yeah.